Hi everyone, this is Jason from Jason's Exotic Reptiles, and I'm here at New England Reptiles with this guy. Super handsome, super awesome, Kevin McCurry. I own New England Reptile Distributors. It owns you, I heard about this. And I am a guy that breeds bullets in the dark depths of like a cave, like a in the basement. And I'm, I'm breeding all sorts of amazing bullets. And then I'm here to educate you. And this guy's got this giant building filled with all sorts of nonsense. And I spread everything from the gnats and the gnats ass to reticulated pythons. You are a good carrying humpback fly here. I think most reptiles and reptiles are. So today, I'm going to show you guys the reticulated python world race. What's up everybody, Jason from Jason's Exotic Reptiles. Today I'm here at the Wingman Reptile Distributors with Kevin McCurley, the owner and operator of this place. He's the premier reptile breeder. He's bred all kinds of retics, burby, pythons, ball pythons, water monitors, whatever you think of, he's bred it before. Gnats, he breeds the shit out of gnats. But uh, today we're gonna take a look at reticulated python growth rate. This is gonna take you from babies through adults, males and females, help put some perspective into what you guys can expect as you buy these animals as pets or breeders. So I'm gonna kick this over to Kevin. He's gonna take it away, show us a couple babies he has. Then we're gonna go through some juveniles and some adults. I don't know what a babel is. The babels. Okay, so uh, one thing that is uh, contrary to what a lot of people believe, hi sweetie, is reticulated pythons are indeed the longest of all pythons or boas in the world, and they are indeed a python. So they are the longest, they set the record uh, size of any animal that's a big giant snake. Yeah, no, so I'm getting distracted. Now I'm getting distracted. Okay, <laughs> so we have mainland, and then we have also a lot of island locality animals. And the island locality animals uh, genetically have uh, more of a probability to, to stay smaller. And I think that's because through you know the time being out on these islands, I see that little snake, uh, they have a limited food source. They don't need to be as big. And so they're more inclined to be uh, smaller growing. So when we talk about Jampea, Kaiwaudi, Honey Island, uh, Makassar, stuff like that. These are animals that could be smaller growing. So here's an orange ghost stripe, which is a, originates a Jampea type. And uh, so that is a, that is a dwarf. Essentially. This is a type of dwarf, and I have a lot of dwarf, you know, animals in my bloodline, even including uh, things like uh, Golden Child. All that stuff is a smaller growing uh, phantom stripe, orange ghost stripe. All that stuff is smaller growing. So when we say smaller growing, it means that the uh, size potential of these animals can be anywhere from probably seven foot to 12 foot comfortably. If we do more mainland types, or if we're talking about platinums and a lot of albinos, and uh, these animals can indeed grow larger, but the more you put into them is going to basically dictate how big they're going to get. Uh, you're also, you can do things uh, restricting food, and restricting food, you know, people sometimes get a little confused by this, but as, as I'm raising an animal, and I know it's a male, and I know, let's say, it's six or seven foot, I know I'm gonna have that animal breeding, as I start getting to that size, I will start pulling back the food. I don't need to feed it a lot, whereas a female, she needs to be larger, so I'll feed her more food to get her to uh, be a safe size where she can reproduce, lay eggs, not get egg bound. Um, but basically, you're limiting the food. You just don't keep gunning the food to them because they're going to take all that food energy and convert it into growth. So if I want to have an animal that has a more limited size, I'm going to work with uh, something that has some type of dwarf blood. Uh, even the mixes will be more limited. I can tell you that I've been able to take pure dwarf blood, such as the Jampea, and I have been able to, through heavy feeding, I've been able to get it up to about 14 feet. But I have, we're right next to my original uh, female cow, which is an orange ghost stripe, phantom stripe, and she's about 10 years old, and we're, we can show you how big she, she is. And what she, about this one here? So this is, I'm so assuming, is a pie. That's a piebald. So a piebald is going to be more of your mainland type. Go slow if your camera catches up. Whereas this is orange ghost stripe. So the, so the pine has the full growth potential where because it has no dwarf blood in it for the most part. And then the orange ghost stripe that you have in your hand, that one has somewhat of a, let's call it a 50% dwarf potential into it. So it won't get quite as large as a full full mainland retic, but it'll still get some pretty good size to it. 
compared to one, like the GMP. One little uh, interesting world. note when uh, when US Arc and I was you know we're involving the injurious invasive uh, python uh, ruling. U.S. Fish and Wildlife was uh, basically, they put out a 330 page document that I was going over and, and it was my job to argue against it uh, to a judge. And one of the things that they said that a reticulated python within five years can reach a size of 25 feet. And you could buy a reticulated python normally in a pet store. So people were gonna go and buy these animals and be, in five years they're gonna have to be feeding them goats and cattle or whatever. So no, how much truth is that? Is, there's no truth to that at all. So we can show you. So this is 2019 baby. This is an animal that might be eating uh, once a week, once every 10 days. And since we have a lot of snakes here at New England Reptile, uh, one of my things I don't generally do is raise snakes really fast because I have a lot of animals. I, uh, it's, it's very taxing on the food supply that I have. And uh, so I just kind of raise them comfortably. So in the wild, they'd also probably appreciate the same kind of a slower growth rate. I literally could take this little animal, which might be you know 30 inches, and if I was really putting the food to it, I might be looking at an animal right now that'd be 48 inches. And now to clarify, that's not power feeding it with food. That is just being consistent on a consistent feeding schedule and feeding it as if it was in the wild and there was just an abundant food supply. Yeah, so these animals are opportunistic. So every time you offer it a rodent, a lot of times they're gonna see that opportunity and keep eating. Um, but you know, if you wanna hold the animal and do all that stuff, you really wanna basically make sure that you're feeding the animal and you're giving ample time for that animal to actually digest its food. Because when I am holding these animals, after they've eaten a large meal, which is called a you know, bolus item, it's probably uncomfortable. So I think like after you've eaten you know, Thanksgiving, as this animal metabolizes, starts breaking down uh, whatever it ate, it's very taxing. They go through a major physiological change. Uh, their blood becomes very uh, rich in uh, cholesterol and fats and all that. Uh, their heart will grow. They'll you know, get larger, so they, they go through this incredible change. So it is taxing on them. Their body temperature goes up as they're metabolizing and digesting it. Calories are being uh, realized and all that. So generally, I don't want to feed it a big meal and then go and hold it. So if it's a pet, you know, you feed it and then you're like, okay, I'm going to give you a good three days to actually get that thing digested, and that is critical. So, and I think what's actually really cool, and again, a little off topic of the video of the growth rate itself, but is this snake wanted to light me up and light Kevin up when we first took it out. And it's just super cool. That was just, chill being, right it was just being defensive. Yeah, it's just nervous. So one of the things we did is as I was going through or looking for snakes for the video, I'm opening willy-nilly drawers, okay? So yeah. the animal's sleeping. So if I just like, you know, imagine if you're sleeping and then suddenly you're slid out so you got this whole whole world shifting and whatever and all of a sudden you have to wake up and there's two people glaring down at you. That can be um, very uh, shocking and it'll put that animal to a, a very uh, defensive state. So remember we have snakes that live in uh, modes. So that animal just had to basically realize and kind of catch up and what we did was we uh, basically involved the animal's brain and we just did supportive handling where we just give it a chance to collect itself and take it all down. So why don't we put these guys back, pull yep. out maybe a juvenile, something that's like a two to three year old snake, then we can compare the sizes of those. And I think Kevin, you have, we might need to cut this video and come back to it so we can put these guys back. But um, unless you have some snakes right there, what do you think? Well, let's see, cause that one right there has no lid. That has no lid, but I'll keep an eye on that one. So okay. let's see, well, Kevin, what, um, so so, what snake are you gonna pull out next? I see, I'm being looked at by a big, Big calorie tick. So I can show you. This is a the super expression of the phantom stripe. So that's what we just looked at. So okay. we're looking at orange ghost stripe. Okay. So phantom stripe is also it's another dwarf. So this is a blue-eyed leucistic reticulated python. Hi, buddy. And I just woke him up. So once again, you know, I mean, I'm sitting here rubbing this guy's face, and he, he just did that because he was scared. Yeah. Uh, he's with a big female. So this animal would be a young adult male. So an animal like this could be uh, two to three years. So the way we okay. kind of raise snakes, this could easily be, uh, it's, you know, it's a dwarf animal, so it has small lineage. This guy's probably, you know, five and a half feet long. So he's big enough to breed. And uh, he's full of testosterone right now. So one thing you do want to note, reticulated pythons, as some snakes and certainly things like iguanas, when we go into the breeding state of them, uh, and we start cooling them down, what we're doing is we're spiking the testosterone level of the animal, which actually initiates uh, reproductive behavior. 
and uh, the cooling a lot of times does that. So we kind of make this animal defensive, particularly the pythons will fight with each other and that's not good. So you never want to house any uh, mature reticulated pythons together because you could have a horrific uh, battle. And is that specific to males, males and females? Uh, uh, either reticulated pythons, so if we did like emerald tree boas, green tree pythons, there's a lot of different uh, male species of python or boas that are combative. And uh, so reticulated pythons will actually slash each other. And so when you do have one of these guys as a pet, and uh, it's you know beginning like the fall and into the winter, which is a normal breeding time. If I have this animal, it's my pet, and then one day I go into the cage, and the thing is like, okay, I'm feeling like uh, I want to breed because its testosterone level is going up there, and you notice the feeding is, becomes limited. You just want to realize that these guys, they're uh, they are dictated to some degree by hormones. Look at that beautiful. So, so just like in a male iguana, they can go crazy. So what would be like an equivalent age female of that same size? So that's a male, you said he's about two, three years old, just about at, at breeding maturity so it's about, size. Yes, yeah, it's probably about six foot. Okay, so a female reticulated python at minimum has to be three years. That's a fact. Uh, so uh, Yeah, so I think what happens, even though I can make the female large, I think uh, for an animal to breed and then success, sex, I can't even speak, successfully ovulate, you need to uh, dictate the whole process by uh, luteinizing hormones, which basically is going to um, cause the animal to, uh, as they elevate, cause the animal to ovulate after those mature ovum. And uh, a female that could be 12 foot long of a mainland, she could only be two and a half years old, she has the size, but she doesn't have the hormone levels. So reticulated pythons are definitely dictated by age. So typically, uh, female reticulated pythons need to be three years at the very least, if not four to five years before they're reproductive. And the sizes, uh, the smallest that I ever get would be uh, maybe on a very, very small seven foot. Do you have an example of like a three-year-old female here? Yeah, we can do that. I know you have some bigger females and, and these, these girls have been, uh, you know, like Kevin mentioned, is you can have extremes dependent on feeding. If you have yeah. an abundant food supply, a three-year-old three -year female may be much larger than one that uh, not necessarily been dwarfed, but uh, one that hasn't had that abundant food supply. This is a, this is a three-year-old female, so this is a reproductive female cow. And how big is she? If you, if you step back, how big is she compared to body size in terms of manageability of, uh, of somebody to get? Because that <laughs> looks like a fairly it's manageable probably, It's probably like eight foot. And that's a cow there? This is a cow retex. So this is a orange ghost stripe, a phantom stripe, and a golden child all mixed together. Yeah, and that's a beautiful snake. So that's that's like the equivalent age uh, female snake right there, and that's a good comparison to show you the size. Yeah. So what's interesting? Them. I have some male cow retex, which are about ten years old, and they're just a little bit bigger than this. And uh, so basically, once they've you know hit maturity, we just uh, pull back on the feeding, and you obviously want to you know you you, you want to manage like a a. a kind of a little bit on a slim body weight because in the wild these animals are not these big fat obese animals that we're making in captivity. So I think certainly with females, if you overdo it on your girls, uh, you can have things like uh, heart disease. Uh, certainly uh, too much fat is bad and a lot of times big fat snakes actually don't reproduce because yeah. they don't release uh, luteinizing hormones, they don't cause ovulation. They may actually generate follicles and not reproduce. Another thing, if you take one of these big animals and you get it so it's fat because you're just like constantly, it's always eating and it wants to eat a lot and you're just pushing the food at it. Um, what happens is the animal uh, starts losing its, its muscle mass and it's being replaced by like fat. So the animal starts getting really floppy. I mean, it looks huge and to the, to the novice, it may appear healthy, but when you, you pick it up, you're going to realize how flaccid and soft it is. And that animal, if it were to breed and reproduce, in some cases, they can't push out all their eggs and the eggs are retained and then the eggs go septic and actually kills the animal. So they're more uh, inclined to uh, become egg bound. Yeah, and that's a, I mean, that's a beautiful snake. You can clearly tell these snakes are not underfed. They're nice, healthy weight. Uh, they're, they're, they're not overfed either. So what about, uh, I guess, what would you consider a full grown male reticulated python, like a, uh, not a dwarf, just kind of like a full, as big as you can get. Uh, okay, male. so a male reticulated python can get quite large. So I've had males, like legit males, like 
mainland type uh, 17 feet. And what would be the average on that? Because there's always the exception. Same thing with bow construction. Average, average male mainland retic is probably in the area of 10 or 12 foot. And you really like, if somebody's had it as a pet and they're just like, just gunning the food to it. Now you have an animal that's going to all of a sudden go to the 14 foot size and larger because they grow their entire lives. And a particular python in theory is going to live, could live well over 25 years. Yeah. And in captivity, so I mean, it could actually live to 40 years. You know, who even knows? Because we certainly know ball pythons. I know uh, rattlesnakes, timber rattlesnakes, over 40 years in the yeah. wild. It's like amazing. That's a very rare, rare instance. And it's very hard to document that kind of uh, thing. But uh, so a mainland reticulated python, like the 10, 12 foot is a realistic size where you kind of manage its growth by the amount of food. So, you know, the frequency of feeding might only be a couple times a month, enough to keep the animal satisfied, keep the animal healthy, and you're managing that. Same thing with dogs. Yeah. You know, you manage, you know, start, hey, my dog's trying to get fat. Well, we all know that a dog showing a little bit of ribs is actually healthier than a big fat chocolate lab yep. that just sits there, especially later in life. You're gonna have all sorts of uh, hip displays, you're gonna have arthritis and all these different things like that. But uh, with these snakes, you, you know, managing the, the size on these males, they don't need to be these big fat things. Recently, we even made Snarfles a little fat. He was yep. getting way too much food. So I, we kind of pulled back on that. Uh, mainland female, you could do 12 foot, to 16 foot, could it be realistic? You know, it takes some effort, and a dwarf would be, you know, eight to 12. And do we have any, uh, well, I know you have them. I have a lot of dwarfs. What, what about like an, like an adult female mainland? I'm looking at the girl next to you, it looks like a cow. She's um, not a man, so that is okay. 10 years yeah. of gunning the food to that animal. What would be like, like a, let's say a 14 foot reticulated python female look like? For a size reference to, to understand what 14 feet in a snake actually looks like, because I think that's that's a concern that people have a lot is, and what I see a lot, especially in boa constrictors, is people don't, these snakes aren't as big as, as they might seem. Now, reticulated pythons are certainly large snakes, so you have to have the correct setup and housing to have these animals and be responsible, or you're gonna be just looking for someone to offload it to, which is never a good situation in the end. But if we have something that you would consider as like, this is the average size adult female, to show somebody, you know, body weight, girth. Well, this, this cow, because we pull we, her out? We, we, I really pushed. So we've basically, for 10 years, this is the, one of, you know, this is the first cow reticulated python ever produced. And so we really pushed the food to her to make her big. We love her and she's wonderful. And I want to kind of see how big she would get. But this, with ultimate effort, 10 years is maybe a 14 to 15 foot snake. Yeah. And this would be representative of a mainland female with less work. And you could make a mainland female even larger than this and under the under the 10 year period too. But yeah. I can easily show you this girl. Because I know you've, you've spoken a lot, we've talked a lot about how, you know, it really takes a lot of effort and work to make a snake this size. It, it's not like you just feed these things, keep them in a box and all of a sudden they grow. Um, but this will be good. Oh, she's she's a big snake. How's her how's her temperament? Pretty she good. Yeah. She so is this heavy. Is, this is like 15 feet. Yes, and I would say that that's a true 15 foot. That's all of 15 feet, and um, she's definitely a handful. So if you were to get one of these snakes, Kevin, you would, I'm assuming you would say that you want uh, you definitely want to handle with two people around, especially if you buy yourself. Very, there's very good rules. Um, Basically, when you are keeping larger snakes like this, this is not a snake for everybody. You can have a very rewarding experience because having a large, social, trusting, friendly animal is very rewarding. Uh, with that comes some responsibility. You can slide her back in her case. Some, some, awesome. some responsibility. I'll keep talking. Yeah. And the responsibility is uh, you have to basically have the size of the cage. When you are handling a large animal like this, uh, as wonderful as she is, uh, you know we have a lot of experience. So I read these animals, and I'm not, I'm not worried. But to somebody that has a lot less experience than I do, uh, they will misread uh, points of the animal. Certainly, is going right in, right in uh, her feeding, uh, her feeding behaviors. Is she comfortable? 
So we always have to think worst case scenarios. So it's a good idea you have any animal, you know, I could, I could even say eight foot, but you know, any animal over 10 foot. And this is also applicable to like boa constrictors. Yeah. You can get a large eight foot boa and an eight foot boa compared to an eight foot reticulated python. Eight foot boa is wow. That it is one, that is a serious, serious yeah. animal. Uh, an eight foot retic just doesn't generally have the kind of girth that, uh, or the power that a big boa does. And boas, certainly as they get larger, sometimes they get like insecure and they'll kind of like heads wobbling and they'll coil their tail up and they get a little bit crazy and they'll, they'll do this back and forth. But boas are very, very powerful. So an eight foot boa can be just massive. And I think you saw that. If you watched one of my, uh, my last videos on the boa locality, at the end I pull out the big Pacalpa Peruvian. I was out of breath with that snake. That, that was a very, very large snake. And to Kevin's point that, that yes, it, just because it's an eight foot snake, doesn't, they're not all created equal. I gotta say, that was a very heavy snake. I would not wanna, I would not wanna handle that snake by myself, um, unless there was somebody in, in a good close range, just being responsible, being responsible with keeping and handling. Uh, but I think these snakes are really super cool. They can make a good pet. I would think that if you're a little bit more experienced in keeping, you would, you would uh, maybe wanna consider looking into these if, if this is your thing, looking for a big snake. Uh, that is a gorgeous snake right there. So what is, what is that one there? I'm assuming a this, couple year old male? This is actually a female. Okay. So she's, uh, she's over two years old, but she has a lot of dwarf blood in her. So this is basically an albino, golden child, tiger, phantom stripe. But she is literally just and bright then, orange. Uh, what are point. your thoughts in terms of keeping these things as, as pets? Um, obviously, well, at least I would think not a first time pet. No, uh, so this is okay. So, a couple things I wanted to add to this is uh, this is for more advanced hobbyists. Uh, so, if I was going to keep a ball python or king snake or corn snake or sand boa, some of that is uh, basically it's entry level animals where they're never going to get too large to manage. But a boa, generally, as we start talking about like uh, any kind of boa that can grow maybe over six foot or whatever, that's more like maybe towards a medium level. But as the animals start getting larger, including, you know, boa, constrictor, constrictor, imperator, all that, that can get larger, you always want to consider that. One of the things about reticulated pythons, they're very rewarding to keep because uh, their brain and their mindset is, is some of the most, uh, you know, intelligent of all uh, pythons and boas. Reticulated pythons are on the edge of being a snake genius. Uh, their personalities are wonderful. Uh, all the array of colors and patterns. Um, they're definitely a very smart animal. They can be uh, challenging because they have this mindset. I would say that uh, if I took, if I wanted to compare a boa constrictor mindset to a reticulated python, the reticulated python makes the boa constrictor look stupid. And it's, it's true. It hurts my feelings with that. No, I, I keep boa constrictors and uh, so the next step beyond a reticulated python would be something like a king cobra. But there are certain uh, in, pythons. In terms, of, in terms of intelligence. Intelligence, Not, I'm not sorry. keeping, don't go by no, king No, 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 excuse me. So king cobras are literal geniuses. Uh, they're so aware. So uh, the reactiveness and their ability to uh, constantly change how they're thinking and how they're perceiving their environment. Uh, recognition, uh, reticulated pythons are very, uh, indicative of recognizing their keepers. Uh, if you mistreat them, they're gonna respond accordingly. If you are correct in your management of the animal uh, and you provide security and uh, you'll build trust with that animal so you can have an animal like this, it's 12 foot long and it's actually wonderful. And, and I wanna to add to what Kevin said in terms of uh, you know, entry level keeping versus more experienced hobbyists. It's not so much to say that these snakes are more or less difficult to keep and it, it's, I think it's more understanding the reaction of a bite from a 12 foot reticulated python or handling a 12 foot reticulated python in general is a lot different than handling a, a four foot corn snake. So you need to be able to understand to read the snakes, understand how they're reacting. And that's something that Kevin does very well. Uh, and, and even Kevin mentioned the King Cobra. So he just got an amazing leucistic King Cobra. I'm sure you've seen the video. If you haven't, you have to go check it out because it's pretty ridiculous. Well, uh, so, so, so I think with, with that and said, to close this video, in terms of uh, just reticulated pythons in general, what advice could you give people who are looking to get a reticulated python, 
in terms of keeping them in captivity from, from growth rate to feeding to cage size. Uh, just to just to do it successfully, not so much to breed them, but let's say I wanted to buy a That's a lot of things today. for me to answer. Well, well, I mean, you think you'd want if to you start wanna, with if you want yeah, if you want yes, you want to buy a reticulated python. You always want to anticipate how big is it going to get. So I don't want to sit here and go, well, I have a twenty long fish tank, and I want to buy a reticulated python, and that's as far as I think you need to think ahead. It's it's that same way even when you're buying fish and certain predatory fish, how big it's going to get. Uh, so. Always consider you know your size management of boas, uh, Burmese pythons, yep. uh, reticulated pythons. So reticulated pythons and uh, Burmese pythons are going to pretty much be in the same class as far as uh, size potential. Can you source uh, rodent supplier? Can you eventually manage the size of the cage? Uh, potentially the size of the animal. Uh, you know, are you going to have somebody else to help you? You know when you're cleaning it or, or watching it. Um, reticulated pythons versus, let's say, Burmese pythons. I've done videos on this. I find the reticulated pythons like the next step up from the Burmese pythons. Uh, the reactiveness and a, there's more of an edge to the intelligence, I think, of a reticulated python to a Burmese python. Burmese pythons are glorious. They're wonderful. They uh, can be ridiculously uh, tractable, reliable uh, pets. Um, I just like the retics a little bit better, I suppose, is because of the challenge of them. I like uh, some of the the color and pattern mutations yeah. of Python reticulatus versus uh, Burmese pythons. Uh, yeah. So these are all things you need to consider. But you know, you do your due diligence, understand what you're doing. Uh, I will always stress. Going out there and relying on the internet and getting all sorts of varied opinions that are conflicting in some cases uh, is not a good idea. You want to find a couple of reliable sources and I'd really drain all that information from it. And I certainly think that uh, information that I put out there is credible. Certainly Jason, I watch Jason's videos. Jason is like one of my little underlings, yeah. whether he wants to say it or not. But uh, Jason, like the, the grasshopper of the, uh, the Jason, Jason has uh, benefited uh, from having a, uh, years of a relationship with myself and my company. I do breeding with Jason, not personally, but we do. <laughs> we, uh, we breed snakes together and uh, he's my buddy, so we, we comfortably work together and Jason gets to see all the insides of this and he's always you know, a very welcome uh, visitor to New England Reptile where he can go through any cage, he can look at anything he wants, so he has a huge uh, access point to all sorts of interesting animals. So I think his information is really credible. And that was awful nice to say. I no, feel, it's true. feel like I need it's a just, tissue now. I'm going to cry over it, here. Yeah, it's, it's, no, it's and, and to reiterate that, Kevin's been a, a great mentor over the years. He's been a great friend to, to give me opportunities that, to, to take some of his snakes in, breed them. The trust and the confidence that he's, he's uh, allowed me to have is just incredible. So, um, I, Kevin, I really appreciate you doing this video. Uh, some awesome snakes here. Again, if you guys aren't subscribed or you're not watching it, I don't know what you're doing, but go check out New England Reptile Distributors channel. It's got some really cool content, some water monitors, retics. It's got a spread of everything you can imagine. So much more wider base than what I can provide you. So again, Kevin, I appreciate it. And uh, let's end the video here. And if anybody want to chime in here, we did a bunch of uh, prior takes because Jason's working on <laughs> copying my bubblegum video style, but uh, he's learning about editing. But we did a whole bunch of really obnoxious, goofy, beginnings and uh, he was concerned that we want to keep it a uh, very uh, not too much humor and basically just provide uh, information but don't kind of get people to uh, mock us in the fact that what we are actually talking about is actually very credible but I like to I like to joke around I'm incredibly sarcastic I'll put and some I, of that in there I'll make sure I put some clips in there have to be have to have fun we are keeping uh, all sorts of cool reptiles so we have to be uh, yeah. so goodbye guys